but luckily I kept all of my hair and <laughs> you, you grew some a, more. <laughs> you did as well. Yeah, I grew but you know, honestly, your hair right now is the hair that I hope one day to have. <laughs> when, and your beard Remember, though, if, if if I have your beard, something's gone very wrong. Yes, I, this beard is it's just it's just teeth you can see through this beard. I'm just <laughs> all you can uh, I brought a cane too. As oh, an accoutrement. <laughs> that's good. That's good. I wore this beard for my recent descent video and I, I yes. got about 30 seconds through the runtime before realizing, <laughs> first off, all you can see is my lips, which is kind of nasty. And then just sort of wet hairs blowing. I see that. <laughs> yeah, it's just, it's truly foul. Oh my God. Okay. It's, and I, they just start flaking off. You know, um, yes. Rod, Rodney, Rodney, mm. Rodney Smith, would you like to uh, introduce yourself to the Shadow of <laughs> Down audience? Sure. Because Hilariously, they might not be able to recognize you given no, your I'm amazing gonna, I'll de beard myself. Okay. Uh, let's de beard. But I can't. I can't de-hair myself. That's gonna have to last. Also, I, I oh wait, I taped my beard to my headphones. One second. Okay. I, I didn't anticipate. We this didn't part think of it. this bit through <laughs> no. at all. Yeah. Ooh. Ah. Okay. Leave it on as a kind of fashionable neck beard. <laughs> okay. Well, okay. yes. Thank you. Yeah, I'm happy to introduce myself. Hi, everybody. It's me. I'm Rodney. Rodney Smith from uh, Watch It Played, uh, and a YouTube years... channel about board games. As it turns out. Uh, and it, we didn't know this, and we wouldn't know it for many years, but you and I actually, I guess, decided to start our websites in the same... Did you start yours in summer 2011? It was, yeah, I think the first... Gosh, I should go look. I think it was June. Oh, oh, goodness. I think that might even be when the first Shadow Puts It Down. Episode. Stop it. Hang on. I'm going to go take a quick okay. look while, while we're, we're chatting here. <laughs> oh, wow. I think it was, though. And it was... Uh... It wasn't... Episode one of Shut Up It's Down came out on the 8th of July, but we'd have been working on it in June. Yeah. I'm just looking now. Sort by date added oldest. Let's see. Here we go. Ju oh, July. July 15th. Oh my God. So we both came out in July 2011 <laughs> yes. with our first ever pieces of content. And now look at us. Look, look at us. Updates <laughs> in the year 2021. Can't remember things that happened 10 years ago. No. Smith and Smith. Look at so, that. <laughs> yeah, so um, we thought, uh, for everybody watching this, um, that Rodney and I would do a kind of weird double interview. Um, yeah. So we've, oh, there's so much hair in my mouth, Rodney. <laughs> so much. See, you should have uh, gone with the paper beard. Yeah, I, why paper didn't I think of that? Is... <laughs> You've absolutely outclassed me. Um, okay, so, right. I I actually, I don't want to, like, launch us into this. Also, sure. I found out you were drinking during this, so I got myself. I, well, yes, bottoms so, up, cheers. Bottoms up, cheers. 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 Okay. Oh, there right. we go. You weren't. There we go. Cheers. And cheers Ooh. to everyone watching. Thank you for joining us for this little introspective conversational piece. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, we don't know where this chat's going. So all Rodney and I did is we did a preliminary call saying, well, what should we do for this? Should we just ask mm. each other questions? Yeah. And we, we both ag agreed. Yeah, we should. And that that's kind of the extent of it, because as soon as we realized that we can both motor mouth at each other, we knew we had to do like zero <laughs> we had to additional stop. prep. We had to stop, because we started, in the tech test, we just started gabbing and talking about games yeah. and things. And it's like, we got to save some of this. Yeah, we do. Um, so, I mean, I, I, I've got a sort of, my harder questions come later, and there's, oh, there's, some, there's some real hard questions. ones. But to begin with, I'm going to give mm. you the, what I consider the, the softest of softballs. Okay. okay. This will set the tone, won't it? It might. It might. This is the soft one. We'll see. Okay. How do you like the name Smith? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> that is a soft one. Good. Um, I I do like it. I do like the name Smith. Um, I've always, you know, what the, the harder thing is is Rodney. Frankly, yeah. It's that has Rodney been name. difficult for you? Well, it's just it's just not a common name. And so I remember it was at I think the gathering of friends. I think you and I were both there, and there was mm. I want to say there was two other Rodneys in the room. That was unusual for me. I'm not okay. used to like hearing someone say, hey, Rodney, and then it's not meant for me because I never grew up around other Rodneys. You know what I yeah. mean? Yeah, well, so I do. I mean, unsettling. <laughs> my name is Quentin. I didn't realize Rodney was an unusual name. Mm -hmm. But like, my, I mean, my parents were like, oh, well, you know, because my sister is, one of my sisters is called Zena. And so okay. I think my parents were like, well, we're, we've saddled them with this super generic second name. <laughs> let's, let's give them a right. first name just to make sure yeah. they get bullied at school. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah, cool. I uh, my so Rodney was my grandfather's last name, so I think that's really where that came from. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Good. Well, uh, yeah. Weirdly, there's something about Smith that I just find kind of classic. Like it is. It's, it's not boring. It's like you know, there was that you know Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie. I know Smith and Smith. Smith. Right. Yeah. 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 
the, it's kept the... it a little bit cool i think yeah <laughs> so that was that question didn't really go anywhere i'm not sure where i was expecting it to but i feel like uh well that's... did you get teased a lot for your name uh quins uh i don't know if the shut up and sit down audience know this but Qu so quentin i mean i got teased for my accent more than my name i used okay. to speak i used to speak like all five members of the famous five talking at once um like sort of uh you know i'll do my i'll do what i used to sound like when i was seven okay. also americans might not be able to tell the difference but i i used to speak like this and i was very excited to see everybody i i yes. spoke like an english child in an american horror film um, okay. That's how I would describe my ex. And, and so did was... you did you have to conscientiously change? Like, did you want to conscientiously yeah. change that? I, yeah, I yeah, I I went through primary school and was fine. Then as soon as kids started getting mean, I was like, oh, I can't talk like this. Oh, wow. <laughs> I got to And then rounded off all of my. I mean, yeah, I still sound posh to English people because I am. Yes. But uh, but yeah, but Rodney, what was? I, I do want to get to actual board game relevant questions. <laughs> but so your experience growing up as a Rodney, tell me about it. <laughs> Where would you like me to start? I have to say, growing up was a little tricky because I, I was definitely, oh. um, well, growing up wasn't actually that difficult. You just, it just sort of happens to you, I suppose. But I, uh, yeah, I definitely got teased a lot when I was younger, a lot. Um, I think I grew up in a very conservative upbringing, like super oh, yeah? conservative. And so I was, I didn't, I didn't know what was cool or popular, or I didn't have any of those touchstones that people did, like the movies and the music and everything. So I was just, it was strange. It was odd. And it was just funny, you know, actually I was watching the stream here before uh, it started and it, it, it just finished up um, going through one of the games and it was cutting to the interlude, right? And showing the different games that you guys uh, have done videos for. I think uh, Bitoku? Bitoku, yeah, yeah. Bitoku, Bitoku. And I was looking at that thing and Tom's explaining it, right? And there's like tiles everywhere, graphics everywhere, dice everywhere, a thousand components. And he's been talking for about 10 minutes and it's like, it's just a ton of stuff. He goes, and that's the basics. Now let's get into the grit. <laughs> and I was like, my goodness, we are a weird bunch. Like, the, yeah. cause I look at that thing and I just, I'm fascinated by it, right? Like I'm intrigued, I get drawn in yeah. and excited about it. And I guess, why did I say that? I guess maybe that's, a, there's a little tie in there. To, like in my childhood, I was always drawn to things that were a little different or weird. And I felt like a little bit of an outsider that way too. Huh. So maybe, maybe there's some of that that, that connects but in this board game space it's like you find your tribe a little bit you know? yeah uh, i uh there's a there's a oh my oh, i literally had a therapist help help walk me through some of these revelations but as mm. a kid um right. i have a really vivid memory of my dad taking me to a, a hobby sh a, a shop in london called leisure games which is still around today okay. um and shut up and sit down actually has an affiliation relationship yeah. with them which i'm super happy for because they have amazing staff amazing selection in the middle of nowhere in north london but i would make right. that pilgrimage all the time because yeah. to me i would walk in and it was like an aladdin's cave like there were just so many games and like i knew video games as a kid but the idea that there were all these board games and card games like mind blowing. each each box was like full of possibility you just you just didn't know what ideas or adventures yeah. or stories yeah. would come out of these boxes but i didn't have really many people to play games with when i was a kid you know right. i eventually got a couple but by and large like i was always kind of the like i had a super privileged upbringing but when it came to games and people to actually share them with i was the orphan at the glass being like oh maybe one day i'll have people <laughs> sure, to play yeah. them with. and yeah. so there is there is definitely a through line for me to from like kid who didn't have anyone to play games with to adult who will force that to be their entire life and live in this like kind of fulfillment fantasy that isn't actually yeah. quite fulfilling but nonetheless is what i'm pulled towards yeah um, yeah well, it's, it's a common refrain too like in the comments of uh the videos uh, i'll often get comments from people going this game looks really awesome i wish i had somebody to play it with yes and and I, I mean for my... 10 years 10 years that's i've been hearing that from gamers, yeah but what know? kills me about that is like there'll be that that comment oh this game looks amazing. i wish i had someone to play it with and like mm. first off i've been there literally yes but yes. also that comment will have like 18 up thumbs yes, know, and it's like there's at least 19 of you here like <laughs> you know we can play board games online i feel bad for shut up and sit down not yeah. looking into all the different ways you can play board games online until covid happened but well look a similar thing for me honestly i the the last year i have played many more games and actually here's the funny thing quins i've played more physical versions of my games but remotely so i have uh Wait, what? I haven't. I have. I'll, I'll explain. I haven't been <laughs> as drawn to uh, some of the different digital formats. I use them, but I love. Every, we, we all love moving the physical components around, right? Well, I. Uh, well, this is going to answer a question I was going to ask you a little later, but what the heck? <laughs> um, I my my uh, uh, 
my interest in board gaming has not diminished over the last 10 years. If anything, yeah. I would say it has, has, has heightened, certainly evolved in different ways, but also heightened. And I discovered a style of game recently that just kind of like blew the doors off of like what I had been experiencing in board gaming. It wasn't, okay. again, like it wasn't that my interest in gaming had diminished. I just discovered a new style of game I'd never played before. And there was that kind of rejuvenating sense of, oh, this is like a whole new frontier. Coin yes. games. Coin games is what I I, I Oh, okay. you got into them. Huh? Yeah, I got, I got into, into them hard. I'd had a couple of them for years uh, just sitting on my shelf. Do you want to give a quick explanation? Because I think we yes. might end up releasing yeah. this chat as a podcast or a video on YouTube. Yes, so we what, have what to are do. coin games? Absolutely. So coin is shorthand for counterinsurgency. And so it's, it's, it's irregular types of conflicts. Uh, sometimes when we think of war we think of like two sides clashing on a battlefield kind of thing like memoir 44 style you might think mm. of a war game like that right um callback by the way to your very first episode where uh, <laughs> memoir 44 was well in the review you um, did not i hope you didn't go back and watch those oh i did no I did, indeed um we'll talk about that later too okay. the um but anyway so i i uh so counter coin games take a different approach it's not like two forces meeting on the battlefield it's the way a lot of conflicts actually happen, I think, or more commonly, which is you have a variety of different factions, each with their own unique interests, but those interests jam up against each other. Mm. Um, so, for example, a very – the one I started on, I actually have it here. Um, let me <laughs> – this is – this is uh, this could be a big mistake. This oh, no. Are you lifting the board? Mistake. Oh, yes. no. Okay. So this oh. is a coin game. <laughs> this is – so this is people listening on podcast. Uh, I'm holding up a board with wooden pieces <laughs> on it. <laughs> Imagine a board game. Uh, anyway, so this is this is a coin game, and so there's four different factions. You got the syndicate; they're interested in opening up casinos and making money. You've got the directorial, which is um, interested in overthrowing the government, but they're a little more democratic. You've got uh, Fidel Castro's crew, which is uh, July 26. They have a they want to overthrow the government, but they have again a different agenda. And then you've got the government, who's just trying to hang on to power. So these four different forces meeting, having asymmetric. Uh, actions, goals, etc. Anyway, this is a long story to say. When I finally learned how to play, it really felt like a very different style of game. And it got me very excited. And I realized I could play these remotely. Um, right. they, they work perfectly. So I will take my phone and I will record my turn in a little video message and I'll send it to my opponent or opponents who have the board set up in their homes. They'll update the board. They get a little message from Rodney. They update the board and then they make their turn send it back over to the rest of the people. And we, you know, we just yeah. on our own time play when we're able to. And it's just been fantastic. I've been playing I, game after game after game. I've got three of those games set up in the other room right now. So really? Yeah, yeah. I've fallen <laughs> far down this hole. I um, think that, yeah, no, the last two years, as, as horrible as they've been for so many people, um, really encouraged Shut Up and Sit Down's crew to, to discover mm -hmm. new games as well. You know, it, it like Tom uh, f finding, discovering uh, th uh, thousand, ten, thousand, thousand year old vampire. Yeah, um, I picked that up for myself and my kids off of that review. It, wow. it just seems so fascinating. That was yeah. such a fantastic review. Anyway, everyone should check that out. It's such so good. Yeah, it's, it's really just terrific. But yeah. um, it's it, it was revelatory for us because you know, a it's like the idea of a journaling game is not something that I thought I would have enjoyed. Turns out, I right. absolutely do because like I feel like I spend more time. Oh, there's a line I go back to on on or think use when I'm reviewing games a lot, which is yes. like, how much time do I spend thinking? Or like, you know, like whether that's daydreaming or envisioning what's happening on the board or calculating my next move. How much do I find thinking and in, in sitting in, in, in thought versus everything else? Um, right, and right. for a thousand year old vampire, it's like when I imagined a journaling game, I imagined, you know, writing like an essay. But actually, <laughs> yes. the, the experience of playing thousand year old vampire is rolling the dice, getting a prompt of like this happens to your vampire. What does it mean? And then staring into space and just entering an incredible imagination palace. And just thinking, what does that? Oh, my character could do this. My character could do this. Mm -hmm. And it's like the it's like being in a sauna of imagination. Yeah, like, it's so evocative. But but what I was saying, in inexpertly, is that the pandemic has allowed us to discover digital games, solo games, and just the joy of concurrent play. When I was done with um, uh, Hostage Negotiator Career, which is right. the, which is this wild, absurd, one hundred and fifty dollar. Uh, package that enables you to play Hostage Negotiator, a solo game in a campaign. And I know yes. that you know this, you're smiling because you have the sequel to that game. You have Final Girl and you're showing it on camera now and I hate you, I hate you. Um, so Hostage Negotiator is being reimagined as a game called Final Girl. Yeah. Um, where players are not negotiating with a hostage, but running away from a slasher. Um, 
And then confronting it as the final girl. Oh, do you? You actually down. kill them after running away the whole time? Is that well? That you're works? you're you're really like trying to tool up. You you know. So basically, it's like you're you're taking on the role of that you know, uh, young female compatriot in a group of friends, and all your friends are being hunted down. And eventually, after the fear subsides, you realize you gotta like find your resolve because if you don't stop this killer, no one's going to. And so you become the final girl through this journey type of thing. And it's just, I've been having, just to build off what you were saying, I never really played a lot of solo games, right? Yeah. And this, you know, I'm not even into horror either, really. So those two things were already a knock against this game. And I played it and I was just like, oh, I'm going to play all these scenarios. That's what my brain went like, this is, I'm going to have this coin game set over there. I'm going to have another little table for solo play a final girl. Just yes. fantastic. Yeah. So uh, all of this then, if we're talking about, um, because I could tell that you were answering your own question with the question being uh, like, how has your experience of board games changed yeah. over the last 10 years? Yeah, right? exactly, exactly. And I, I, I've got, there's a lot of different answers to that question for me, but <laughs> the, but, but related to what you were saying, I think I've come to realize that when I started this, I thought the hobby was for people who enjoy playing games together. That's what you assume right. that the board sure. game hobby is. Yeah. And I, 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 after 10 years, I don't know if that's true. Cause I think the people who really okay. stick around in the hobby and get into it are people who enjoy learning new kinds of games. Interesting. I'm thinking like, about that for a second. Yeah. Think yeah. about I the mean, cult of the new. Think about, right? you know, how few board games get played more than like three or four times. Sure. Think about how much how much more keen any board game is going to be to try something to, to the new hotness. If there's one thing that defines the whole hobby, it's the hotness sidebar on BGG. Yes. Which is yep. basically a lot of people looking at games they haven't played and going, I want to play that. And yeah. I think, you know, when we talk about, you know, the last two years um of of COVID horror like rejuvenating our love for the hobby i think that makes sense because a we can't play the kind of games we normally play of course but also it's sure. forced us to engage with types of games we wouldn't normally engage with yeah, which is actually a really true. fruitful way to to yeah. i don't know to keep your passion alive i think so too and I, I think i mean there's a little something that happens when you stay in the hobby for a little while i think because you know maybe you discover like for me it was uh, carcassonne i'd gotten away from board gaming for a while and mm. i discovered carcassonne i was like oh is this what board games are doing these days this seems great you know and because i'd grown up playing some board games but um and some of the like more obscure ones but i got away from it got into video games and that sort of thing yeah but i think when you do have those moments of discovery like i also had just recently with coin games it does put you on this hunt for the next discovery right which i think is mm. part of that cult of the new thing I want to I want to have that experience again where I open something a box up and something very new hit me in the face like I think there's and yeah. that can be a little a little uh mis, not mis, misleading is not the word I want um there's a lot of fun to be had in the same game <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah is what I'm saying like you you can you can you can um achieve a, a level of satisfaction actually in playing a game you already know more than uh, one time but there it, was a, po a podcast i mourn the disappearance of um mm. and i didn't listen to it as or big it up as much as i should but it was do you remember i think it was called the long view or the yes long... yeah 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 because Absolutely. that the, the pitch was we're going to talk about one game each episode yeah. but in each episode we have played that game like 10 times right and that is so antithetical to how <laughs> the entire board game press works sure. and so fascinating yeah. but sorry i cut you off i just no, Please, I think that, I think that, that, really that, that's thread. a perfect dovetail. It's the same same thing. But my point being that when you do take some time to dive into something deeply, you can find a level of satisfaction that maybe even supersedes that 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 thirst for the next thing, which yeah. drives a lot of us. And I'm a big cult of the new person. I love discovering new games. I think you're right, though. I think what you said is a really good point. One of the things that drives me is I do love opening up that new box and discovering that new thing, not just because it's new. But because it's a yeah, I guess I guess because it's new, because it's a surprise. Like what what is hiding in this box? That yeah. that's very alluring, you know. Yeah, and um, you know, so on this subject, like I was I and still am like involved in video games, but but not as much as I used to be. But I was right. in video games for like I, I started writing really young, like 16, 17. I was freelancing for magazines and then but around like by the time I was 27, so about the time like after 10 years of video games, um, I wanted out because mm -hmm. um it just feels very samey like after 10 years the same like arguments and debates about I, i'm gonna throw some words around here like ludonarrative narrative dissonance you know or okay. i don't know difficulty or you know what yeah. i just you had them 10 years ago and now another generation is having them again and you're like oh, wait our games art like which was way more big <laughs> in the early noughties and like 90s sure. you know? but that was a question we for some reason felt we need answering as opposed to the answer being obvious but like i felt like the thrill in game in video games was diminishing returns Okay. Like 
you know, you get, and I think there's a reason that a lot of journalists of like music or movies, aside from the low wages, burn out and stop doing it. And it tends to be a young person's game. Like, whereas board games, I don't feel that's true at all. I, with board games, like you, like you started this call saying, I fit 10 years on, I don't feel even remotely tired of them because I just keep right. finding new veins, new genres, new publishers, new design, new ideas, like new play accounts, even like <laughs> yes. before Blood yeah. on the Clock Tower, I'd never aside, like, right. there are maybe two games in Shut Up Down's history, you know, which are Two Rooms and a Boom and Blood on the Clock Tower, which have seen me engaging with like seriously massive player accounts. And both in both those cases, when I found those games, it just took the top of my head off. Like, yeah. I, yeah. I so don't feel bored and I don't know how you feel. Well, you know, there's um, I, I, something I wrote down here, a quote that I thought was really good. It says, a, a universal truth of board gaming, which is this, how much you enjoy a game, a lot of the time comes down to how much everybody cares about everything that's happening on the table. <laughs> you know what I mean? Where, where'd that come from? That's good. That was you. What? Uh... That was you in your first episode. Um, and what? I thought it was such a good point because when I'm in a board game and I'm like really experiencing whatever I call the joy of like what, what draws me back to this hobby over and over and over again is that suddenly I care very deeply about a bunch of little pieces of wood and cardboard. You know what I mean? Like I care. And when my opponent feels that same depth yeah. and they suddenly they're agonizing over that turn. And I love when that agony and that commitment is not fixated so much necessarily on who's going to win, but that we just care about the journey of the thing you know what i mean yeah, yeah um because yeah. there's there's a there's a little switch that I, I get a little turned off by when i can tell the other person's just caring very deeply about winning <laughs> i don't like that as much but when they're really caring deeply about um what's happening on the table that i don't know there's something very magical about that. okay and if you step away from it, it's like this is cardboard and plastic you know? what game was i oh you know i was, was um do you know what game it was no sorry sorry i i remembered um, okay, there's a kind of game. So I, IW Games, mm -hmm. a publisher, um, I previewed one of their games recently called Mythic Mischief. It's coming to Kickstarter okay. soon. It's really impressed by the rule set. Um, IW also did uh, Moonrakers, if you remember that game. Yes. Yeah, um, yeah. But they have a game that got Kickstarted recently this year, which <laughs> I'm coming at this in the most long-winded way. Sure. They have this game, which is one of those games where you all play gods, and at the start of the game, you're all given a card as to which of these heroes on the board you care about. But that's secret. And then all the players are like manipulating the game state so that some of these humans on right. the board right. they succeed at their quest and some fail. But you're trying to keep hidden which humans you care about. Um, and this is this is a mechanic <laughs> we've seen in a few um, uh, a few games, right? It's this idea that sure. players have a secret a thing on the board that they care about that they need to keep hidden in order to win. Yeah. And I realized when I was reading about this IW game that I I hate that genre. And I was thinking about why, and I realized yeah. the reason why I hate it is because, oh, thank you, Rodney, thank you for your active listening. The reason I hate <laughs> it is because it means all of the celebration you want to do in a game and all of the, Ooh, oh, you, gotta stifle no, it. you, gotta stifle you have it. to stifle it. You mm. have to stifle it. And mm. I realized that's the opposite of how I like to play games. People yeah. make fun of me, but I'm you very self-aware. Yeah. Mm, when I, when I, I'm very self-aware when I do this, but before rolling a dice that like, where, like the odds are completely against me, I'll say, I'm going to do this every, like, I'll be, watch this. Like I nice. will, you know, I'll show, watch this, roll the dice and like, I'll fail. And then people will laugh at me, but I knew that was the state that was happening. I just said that in order to create a really good moment for everybody. Yeah. And yeah. because that creates a good moment for everybody else, that makes me happy. Yeah. So it's, it's, and that's why I, I, I don't know. And I, it took, I've been doing this for 10 years and it took only now that I realize, oh yeah, that's why I hate that genre. Because for me, so much of the fun is how much people care, as you say about yeah. everything everything happening. yeah exactly exactly mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. and that's why like i think you know shot of down has always had such a soft spot for really dry economic games where i don't know containers the one that always comes to mind but like yes any economic like or euros with like i don't know uh heaven and ale where your monks trying to brew beer and <laughs> yeah. people just end up like really stressing about like oh, i just don't think my hops are gonna be ready in time. <laughs> and it's like it's so funny <laughs> yes. it's so funny and i think jeff engelstein has, uh, was the person i know who's talked a lot about this but uh, but within game design circles it's like this idea of the magic circle it's this agreement we all have we come around the table we're right. all going to obey the rules and we're all going to care about this and it's almost like how much do we even love the games versus how much you and i have, how much ha is have you and i been doing this for 10 years because we love the, the the magic circle and the agreement to care 
Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. You know, it's funny because I think about sports or whatever, which are very popular. A lot of people can relate to that, you know, maybe more so than they can the connection to board games. It's a similar kind of fantasy in a way, right? Because it's not like you're the player on the field. You're cheering for something you have no control over yes. or whatever. Yes. And I suppose it's a similar thing. It's just maybe it's a little different with board games because you do have control over it. Really, don't you? I mean, that's that's a major difference, really. <sighs> you, you, you're you you're moving the pieces. <laughs> yeah, you know? yeah. But you, I don't know, you do and you don't. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> well, so how, okay, I have a, we've talked a bit about, well, we, neither of us have asked the question, but I think both of us were going to ask it, okay. which is how has your relationship to chain games changed? Yeah. And yeah. I feel like the answer we both said is it's the same we have the same passion for it as we ever did. Yeah, yeah. If anything, just a little, maybe even a little more appreciation just for having done it for ten years. You know, like yeah. to, to see um, that there's still more to discover is really exciting. Again, to get Final Girl and and just be kind of like, no, oh, can you show the people? Oh, yeah. This is again podcast. This is horrible. But can you show the people at home what the board, the cover to that board? Oh, is it the cover to the scenario? Yeah. yeah so, so it's sort of the way you get it is you get a core box which has the main components. But to play it, you do need a second box, which is what they call a feature film. And so I'm holding up the feature film right now. It's just a little, it looks almost the size of a, a little bit larger than a Blu-ray kind of size box. But then the cover detaches, it's magnetized. It's magnetized very well, by the way. And there's your player board. Wow. That's one half. You detach the bottom here. And then that's the, <laughs> that's the killer that you're gonna go up against. Oh. And they're really nice quality boards. And then inside that box, you've got this really beautiful production, which is, you know, all the pieces that go with Hans, the killer, mm. and you flip it over and all the pieces that go with Camp Happy Trails, the location. So you can then get any of these locations and killers and mix and match them however you want. So it's almost like the board game box is itself a component, which of course we've yeah. seen, but the idea of it like snapping, I don't know, it, it jigsawing yeah. together like that. Um, it's pretty slick. Well. I guess the other reason that maybe you and I have the luxury of still feeling good about board games is I think it's no secret that board game design has just been getting better and better and better. Over the I think so time. too. Yeah. I, 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 uh, I mean, people will say that there's a lot of like reiteration of things. I still see lots of innovation. I don't mm -hmm. expect every game to like blow my head off, you know, <laughs> like, yeah. it's, but I still there, feel like I find plenty that do, you know. There are trends definitely that have come in and out of fashion. And the thing that I'm fixated on that I, I feel like I've mentioned on Shut Up and Sit Down a couple of times recently is like, d d okay, dice, like, you know, yeah. dice were a big part of games forever, literally forever. Sure. And, uh, and, but now people are like, oh, well, what if you, what if the dice were workers, you know, what if, what if the, you rotated <laughs> sure. the dice to show what yeah. level they are? What if right. the dice didn't have numbers on, but instead had symbols? Hmm? What? If, and it's like, yeah, we've, we're in this wave of dice innovation, but what I've realized recently is like, what happened to good why, old dice rolling? Why can't I roll dice anymore? Yeah. Like, and also, uh, this is, get the beards out. Remember when we were kids and we I, used to just I roll the dice? Rolling <laughs> dice. Okay, but no, but we are, but be, designers, to, let me let me say the oldest man thing I'm going to say. Designers today don't have forgotten some really basic dice lessons. Like, yes, so where are they? if your game sees a player rolling one dice, horrible, don't do it. Always have players, I mean, this is now crazy exaggeration, but for me, rolling two dice is on a different order of magnitude in terms of pleasure than rolling one dice because there's no noise when you're rolling one dice Ooh, there's no that yep. it just it kind of just flops out of your hand onto the table yep. as opposed to this grand like clatter 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 roll and then they bounce <laughs> and they go in different directions and then you you know it's there's more anticipation there's more yep. there's more tactile there's more there's a little more delay too if you roll multiple dice it takes a little while to absorb after the roll is done you still gotta like look quickly see what you've accomplished there's that little anticipation did i get enough points one two three four five six you know what i mean there's even did that you have a did you ever play um games workshop as a kid and have the absurdity of rolling like 40 d oh yeah it's, and it's, it's, absurd. It's, it's like but it's like it has the exact same feel of like you know in napoleonic battles where there's all that gun smoke and you can't even see what's happened it's right like when you're all right. 40 they, dice and games, yeah you're right that's the smoke clearing is after they've yeah. laid you doing the math on it is the smoke clearing <laughs> yeah <laughs> but you look at it and even in an instant you're like yeah, oh, uh, oh, yeah maybe uh, oh yeah 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 just enough. <laughs> ridiculous but um you know right one of my favorite things in my board game collection because like obviously yeah. I, i'm lucky enough to have a decent board game collection sure but i wish i had more space because americans are always putting me to shame with game collections that have like 200 or 300 games whereas i keep it about 140 i don't know anyway mm. But it's the rare things that make me happy. And I have an out of print Reiner Knizia book called Dice Games Properly Explained. Oh, no and kidding. It's, yeah, it's amazing. So okay. it's, it's, it's. When I was this from? Do you know? Where or when? Oh, when, like, when? I want to, oh, I want to say like late 80s, early 90s. It didn't wow, have a big okay. print run. Okay. But what yeah, it does yeah. is it documents all of the dice games that used to be played in pubs, but aren't anymore. 
Um, so it's this amazing, exhaustive, like encyclopedic document of like, here are all the dice games you can play, like to, that are kind of like craps, and here are the ones you can play that sure. are like risk yeah, rewards. Yeah. And like, I don't know, it just <laughs> really well. First off, it may, historically it makes you realize that the like, cards haven't quite gone away. Like people still play bridge and poker, right, but sure. dice yeah. games used to be they a huge deal, apparently in the fifties and before, and they've just been erased. Like, yeah, you're right. No one plays them. Yeah, like strictly like, dice games. Like I can think of strike, maybe being yeah. the, and then I can't think of anything else. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't know. Yeah, I can't really. I'm I sure mean, people the only, listening will be shouting out a few, but I can't imagine. The, shout out to yeah. uh, the Chinese. Uh, any any sort of like, uh, well, obviously, what I, I was really lucky. I got to go to China when I was uh, a teenager, and yeah. uh, let me tell you, the crazy thing about that, they play liars dice in clubs in China. Oh, liars dice! Yeah, that's another fantastic. Oh, game. liars! Liars yeah, dice yeah. is maybe yeah. in. Oh, if you were asking me what my top ten games are, and if liars dice was in there, I wouldn't be surprised because. Mm. It, yeah. like in terms of simplicity like how much is going on cockroach poker wouldn't be in my top 50 but liar's dice would be. okay anyway sorry i got into this whole tangent about dice but this is kind of what we were talking about right like the reason we're still yeah. excited about board games is that there's always a new <laughs> strip yes. of going and explore. just when you get tired of something they find someone finds a new way to bring something back Absolutely. to that was maybe a little bit out um you know I, 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 something i wanted to ask you that uh, I was curious about is, you know, you, you review, obviously reviewed a, a ton of games at this point. I knew early on when I was thinking about maybe doing something in the board game media space that I didn't want to review. Hmm. That was something I knew I didn't want to do. What, what drew you to that? What made you want to review board games? Oh, like what, wow. And what do you ultimately see? Like, if you think of a, a review that you've done where you feel good about it, what did it accomplish? In your oh, mind. oh, okay. I got, I got a couple of good. Well, the, uh, the a depressing answer and then an optimistic answer. So, a de okay. depress the depressing answer is, I got into reviewing because it's what I was good at, because it's what I was paid to do, because it's you know since I got my first writing career, right? Like my first freelance contract when I was young, um, I got paid to do reviews, and that pays okay. And it, you know, it's a kind of a, you have to like games to do it because otherwise the time money <laughs> ratio sure. is horrific. Yeah um oh my goodness rodney i remember being paid to review mmos like you get like that's just wild like third you gotta be 30 40 hours of an mmo and then write a 2000 word article and for that you get like 100 quid it's wild oh, anyway anyway ouch. anyway okay but yeah. so we started shut up is down because we looked we love board game uh, paul and i love board games and we looked at uh the board game space and we saw a lot of passion but we didn't see any of the professionalism that you i mean that and that's I, that sounds horrific the point is that Every, the great thing about board games is that everyone was doing it for the love yeah sure which is yeah. which leads to this amazing community and this this unbelievable sort of um tone that the board game community has um which means we kind of came in like jerks because we were like <laughs> like i don't know uh, a, a friend of mine talks about how um games journalism in england in the noughties was like music journalism in the 90s which is there's okay. so little money in it as opposed right. to american video game journalism in the 90s right. there's so little money in british games journalism the only reason you go into it is if you wanted to be really good at it and you really cared about the craft because there was right, no right you weren't doing it for the there wasn't a strong prestige. financial incentive yeah no yeah. no no yeah. you only did it because you loved it but what that meant is like i mean the british video game games press like in it was it's like a pit of snakes like everyone yeah. judging everyone else everyone trying to do their best work um and and that is actually where matt you know came from matt lees of course who joined right. the site almost immediately after it was founded um he was working for official xbox magazine you know reviewing games and being paid to do it yeah um and you know you have to be really good at that stuff you have to be really good because there's otherwise there's loads of people who want to do the job um so we just developed we had those skills and we looked at the board game press and we said well maybe we'll bring these skills to to board games and that's why we did it but the what i you also asked me like why when do you feel like you did a good review yeah yeah what, wife, what for you is what, what are you striving for yeah yes yeah, yeah. so my wife has a good line on this she was the person who pointed out to me that uh, review is a part of the media right and mm -hmm. media you know is part of the word medium you are the medium like a ghost medium um <laughs> between people yeah. who absorb games and people who make them you are the middle bit and so, so there's some like rough and ready stuff that the middle bit has to do, like making sure that, you know, like people who like a certain kind of game can find it. Right. Um, or if a game say has a horrific manual, for example, that people know that before they buy it. Sure. Um, but when you really do your job well, I think as a reviewer is when you take a game 
the a, dev- a design team has just just loved it. They put so much love into it, and they release that to an audience, and you help the audience to love it more. You're able to say, "Hey, here's stuff you would never even have noticed about this game, but this is why it's genius." Uh, like a good shut up and sit down review, I feel makes the audience feel smarter for even finding the game in the first, and then right. it will help them when they get that game to be more excited, to be more appreciative, and like. You know, obviously, I don't know. Sometimes I feel like reviewers can become known for negative reviews, but that's that's part of the job we have to do. We always prefer doing positive reviews, and the best positive review is one where it just brings more joy to the world because it helps that game to find more people, and the people who get it have an even better time. That yeah, because they're probably is, more yeah. primed to enjoy it because hopefully, having watched a good review, they're like, "Oh, these things connect with the things I like about games." Or this yeah. this one seems to hit those those bells and whistles. It improves the odds. No, that yeah, makes a lot yeah. of sense. So I mean, I I I cannot now imagine. So I have a question. I I had <laughs> here, you know, because of course, you know, you have to. How do you know how many videos you've done teaching people how to play games? I uh. I I want to I want to ha- hazard a guess, and I'm afraid I'm going to be wrong. I'm going to overshoot, and then I'm going to feel like a fraud afterwards. Like, oh, I haven't done that many. <laughs> I was going to say 400 tutorials, but I okay. uh, I'm going to double check while you're uh, queuing. Well, up I'm the glad you gave us the ballpark because that's just fun. <laughs> I'm going to find it. It was like you know 150. No, yeah, 432 is where we're at now. Yeah. For, oh, okay, that's pretty good. That's okay. a good, uh, good bad, guess. You bad. undershot, so you were gracious. About good, it. yeah, yeah. And, exactly. and, but you were close. Um, so I've got here crossed out. Has yes. the job changed how you feel about games? But then that's crossed yeah. out and replaced with how has the job changed how you feel about games? Like I, mm. as a reviewer, I know how that changes my perception on game. I'm I'm more critical. I can't turn off the analytical part of my brain. Right. When I'm right. playing something, I'm always thinking about how it'll fit into the content calendar. But what does like looking at rule sets yeah. so closely for 10 years, <laughs> what does yeah. that do to your, what has that done to your brain? Oh, you, you know what? I was going to answer this a certain way. And then the way you asked that question just sent my brain off in another direction. That I want to answer first. How it, cause that has changed. That's changed the wiring in my brain. It definitely has. I, you know, when I am learning a game, uh, I think I'm a bad person to have around in a way. Uh, I don't know. Oh, I feel the same. I mean, I, I okay. definitely like yeah, I've okay. to board game meetups where I just I start criticizing a game and then realize everyone's looking at me funny and I'm like, oh, no, 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 no. no. <laughs> so my, my hang up is I've had too many times where I've gotten a rule book and then discovered that the, what's been written in the rule book is incorrect. Okay. Mm-hmm. And so I've gotten almost a sixth sense for <sighs> reading a rule and knowing it's wrong in the rule book. And so if I'm in a conversation with somebody and I'm like, well, I think this is actually incorrect and the, and the rules aren't meant to be this way. They're like, well, that's, that's not what's there. And I'm like, no, I, I hear you. And I understand why you're reading it that way. I understand why you're saying that. I'm not doing this because it benefits me. I'm doing this because I've, I, I've had this happen so many times that I almost yeah. know the things that, that, frankly, publishers get wrong and rules designers get wrong. Um, so I, I, I'm, willing, I'm willing to bet nine out of 10 that this is meant to be read the opposite of that <laughs> and then and the te- the tenth time you are just a nightmare oh, I'm, yeah and I'm, and, I'm, and I'm also like oh shoot you know like you, you hate being wrong but when you're right it's like it just keeps reinforcing this notion of having a sense so i my wiring i read rule books in a very uh uh yeah uh, uh analytical way that that looks for things that other people would just gloss over and just keep going with because the problem is with a rules video i don't i, I shouldn't say problem i'm happy that this is the a target for which I'm aiming, hmm. which is I want you to re- watch the video and you walk away with extreme confidence that everything I said is exactly true. When you read a rule book, you're not going to have that confidence necessarily. <laughs> uh, but I want you to have that confidence when you leave the, the video. How do you, this is a really d- dull brass tax question, but when sure. you're given a manual that might be wrong or might be yeah. confusing, how do you know you're teaching it? Right? <laughs> That's a good question. So I do take some, I do hope that most of it's correct. <laughs> Hope right? is a part of the process. But, but yeah, but definitely like any, so my process is I get the rule book, I sit down, I play the game fully, of course, and I, I'm jotting notes furiously throughout the whole process. But anything that I have any qualm or question about, I take that right to the publisher, I get the answers, and then all that gets baked into the final video. That's where it gets a little funky because the video will come out, the video will be correct, it'll contradict the rule book, 
And someone watching the video is like, but that's not what the rule book says. And I have to say, well, yeah, but your rule book's wrong. <laughs> uh, but it is kind of nice. Like the publisher gets a second chance in a way, right? They get a second chance. So the game's been published. They've hit print. It's already, they can't fix the rule book now. But with the video, they get a chance to like fine tune. They maybe have seen some questions on, on BGG that keep coming yeah. up. And we can address that in the video. And then hopefully people have a, a smoother experience. But okay. also it is that is that little history of like, I can start to anticipate where the questions will come from. And then try to answer them. You know what? A, f a funny one, Clint. So I did a tutorial video for Monopoly uh, uh, two years ago. Oh, I think and... I know where this is going. Well, it was, no, it was interesting. It was like one of the uh, questions, the, the most common question I get on that video is really one that was kind of fascinating to me. So if you, anyone who's watching, if you remember in Monopoly, in order to start building houses or hotels on the properties, you must own all of the colors of that set before you can build anything. And in the video, I say, uh, you must own all the colors of the set in order to build a house or hotel. The number one question I get in the video from people is, then how do I build if I don't have all the colors of the set? You know what I mean? And it's, it's fascinating because like we can't, that's the answer, you can't, right? Yeah. But to non, I'm gonna say non-gamers, but I don't mean that. Uh, it breaks something in people's brain a little bit because they're sitting there going, but I must be able to build it. I bought this property. You, you're saying I can't build a house on it? That's right. Yeah. You can't until you have the other ones. It's, it's interesting because I'm just used to like all these, you know, you, you must satisfy these conditions before you get to do X. But especially uh, games like Monopoly, people are used to breaking all the rules all the time. So when they bump yeah. up against the rules, it gets a little bit challenging for them. A little bit, yes. You know? I, I remember there was a very, I was playing a game uh, with Matt in, um, in his front room. Uh, it, was, it was like a worker placement. I forget. It was people in the chat will, will be able to remember what this is, but it was a worker placement game that involved getting letters to spell words. Okay. I think uh, I think it was from Renegade, maybe. Um, but uh, you know, she walked in and she was like, "Well, how does this work?" Um, in exactly the same way that my wife will occasionally walk past, kind of like a sort of wild, like like someone who sees a fox in their in their garden. It's like, "Oh, I'll stand and watch this for a while," but I got sure. Yeah. Um, so Matt's <laughs> wife came in and looked at it. And was like, "Oh, how does this work?" And Matt explained, and she was like, "Well, how do you get this?" And he's like, "Well, da da da." So, and then what do you do this for? Oh, well, if you do that, then you can get this track. And what happens there? Well, then you might get a point. And she's like, one point, you get one. <laughs> yeah, it's almost incredulousness, right? It can't yeah. work that way. <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so then, all right. But my question then is, okay, mm. I, now I've got it. You've got, so you've got this analytical mind that is so laser focused that you can notice when manuals are wrong, even without playing the game. <laughs> sure, we'll call that my superpower. Uh, but I feel cheated. <laughs> here's the thing. I know that, that how many bad manuals there are still in the board game space. Oh, sure, yeah. So what is it like exposing your robo robo rule brain <laughs> to bad manuals? Like, can you walk me through what's going on in your head as you're given a manual, which is like almost in the way of you getting to the rules? Um, it's frustrating when I see a game that I think is really good and I see the rule book as a barrier. I understand that fundamentally in a way it's, it's in my best interest for rule books to be bad because then people will come <laughs> to the videos. But, yeah. but putting that aside, I don't want the rule books to be bad. I want them to be so good because no matter what board game it is, this could be someone's first board game. This could be someone's mm. first experience of this larger world that I am, like my life is forever changed by this thing that I love, you know? And that's, this could change somebody else's life. I know it's just board games, but it could, you know? And I, I don't want someone to open up a rule book, read terms they don't understand, Yeah and get frustrated and just say, this isn't for me. Like, clearly this is not for me. I, I'm an intelligent person, but I don't understand. And it's, you know, I don't want that. So I want the rule books to be really good. Um, so my frustration, if I feel anything is, why are you cheating our hobby by making this bad rule book? That's what I feel. And especially because I think a lot of the times the bad rule books, you can identify them pretty quickly. And it feels like, boy, a quick blind play test of this rule book would have revealed these problems. Yeah. Um, if someone had just handed their, what they felt was the final rule book to someone who'd never played their game and said, Hey, I'm just going to sit here quietly and watch you. Please try to learn my game in five minutes. You would have realized, Oh, that's not clear. Oh, I thought that was clear. <laughs> Clearly mm. it's not. And you could catch so many of those little things because no matter how awesome the production is, no matter how amazing the design is, you've got to get through the rule book. You don't get to have any of that fun until you get past the learning that that is a necessary barrier that's why look i'm just gonna rant uh, or not rant rave a little bit more about final girl final girl has a 33 page <laughs> rule book and it was one of the best rule books i've read in a long time and it was just so satisfying because it's a great production with a game i really enjoyed and 
it's got a rule book that I found really uh, satisfying to read. You know, um, I've, to me, that's I, like that's a that's a publisher paying attention to everything. And I really think the rule books matter because it's just a box of stuff until you read the rules. I think that's why I love and have always loved rule books because rule books breathe life into all of those inanimate objects. They turn that hunk of wood into the sword I'm going to fashion on my next adventure. You know what I mean? Like it's wow, yeah, that's really you know, like they're powerful I, thing. I remember um, uh, when I first first started, I, I had the, the the pleasure of some really good rule books because um, we were really into um, uh, the designs of Lada Chwatil uh, when yes. Shut Up Zidane started. Um, yeah, yeah. Blada, now most known as the the very wealthy designer of code names, which <laughs> yes, is which right. is yeah. which is ridiculous. Isn't it fascinating coming yeah. from Mage Knight and all these other like over like really complicated games but well major night i actually know um i believe because uh, uh, philip of czech games edition who um published yeah. a lot of vlada's best games um told me that the reason vlada designed major night was that like whiskers asked him to and i think it was something like he wanted to prove either to himself or to other people that he could design a game with that many rules um <laughs> that's but then and then right, so he right. made this big game and then he made code names tiny game um, but anyway, the games I'm talking about, uh, so the Czech games era of Vlada that I consider just absolutely golden, um, you know, there's oh, uh, uh, the Space, uh, space oh, Alert, um, Space Alert, yes, yes, Galaxy Trucker, uh, Dungeon Pets, um, and then at least a couple of other things Dungeon that I've forgotten. Great. Uh, Lord, Lords of the Dungeon, Dungeon Lord? Oh, Dungeon, Dungeon Lords, Lord. yeah, but I always say Dungeon Pets instead because I think it's better. Yeah, me too. I prefer it. Me too. Anyway, <laughs> but Czech games have had these great manuals at the time. In a way, what was good about those manuals in 2000? 10 or 9 still i don't see in modern manuals which is they were funny like they weren't mm. just clear but they were actually genuinely entertaining and had a sense of humor and also kind of treated what you were doing as intrinsically ridiculous and like i'll never forget if there was a rule that was hard to remember it would have a little pop-up of like dungeon lords had this and i can't there, yes it's throughout all of it all of check games editions of other games but Dungeon Lords had a rule where dragons couldn't go in the cafeteria or something. <laughs> right. And it was just like, a, it was an edge rule. It's like all that wants to go in the cafeteria unless they're a dragon. And there's a pop-up. And I, the fact that I still remember this rule today is- See, that's, the, that's the, the power of it. I, I don't sorry. want rules- Wait, to wait, get, I, sorry. No, I, need to, I need to finish this. Otherwise Please. it's all irrelevant and insane. <laughs> there was a box out next to that dragon rule, which said, oh, of course dragons can't go into the cafeteria because they start food fights. Right. And like, yeah. And that weird non sequitur joke means I still remember that rule. It's still taking up space in my head. Yes. Twelve years later. Yeah, that's that's that's. I don't want too much uh, narrative commentary in my rule books to get in the way, especially mm -hmm. if I'm trying to find a rule book later. But when it tells a little story that puts that little obscure rule into a context for me, like that, like what you just said, that mm -hmm. is a beautiful, beautiful thing because I there's a lot of things you're being asked to hold in your brain when you play a game, and if you can give me a few things to hang those things on. That's that's fantastic. You know, I it's do. funny you said something in your when you were just talking there. You said about um, rule books used to be entertaining, and it's funny because yeah, I told you I was watching your first episode. I don't know if you remember this or not, but the text the, I think the first text that appears on screen while you and Paul are standing amongst pigeons and geese. I felt the kinship by the way when I saw those <laughs> geese. Um, oh, good. Text comes up a new entertainment. Entertainment I thought was interesting as a choice of word because um not always has board game media strive necessarily to be entertaining i think that's something that shut up and sit down did from the jump and very effectively um said hey we, we can be informative but also entertaining at the same time and that's actually maybe ties a little bit into that rule book concept of I'm going to teach you some rules, but I'm going to try to entertain you a little bit. Like this doesn't have to be a drudgery, you know. Mm. It can be fun too, you know. Um, some yeah. people say, "Am I? Am I?" Uh, I've gotten the comment occasionally. Why do you smile so much in your in your tutorial videos or whatever? It's because I'm having fun. I'm teaching board games for a living. Like let's let's have a little joy here, you know. It's it's a it's a wonderful thing to have the privilege to be able to do something like that, you know. And games yeah. are ultimately a fun, hopefully, a fun thing. You know, that just comes from, um, oh God, we had the the fascinating process uh, a couple of years ago of um, wanting to hire new members of staff. Um, mm -hmm. And so that led to the the recruitment of the absolutely terrific uh, Ava Foxport and Tom Brewster, right. who have lent this whole new lease of life and energy to the site. And they're, they're terrific. I just hope they're not watching this because they can't know that I, I feel that. No, I understand. Them. That'd yes. be horrible. Um, but, but, the in <laughs> but the process of hiring interns and looking for hires was was bizarre because we'd been sort of doing the job on autopilot for like eight, nine years, but trying to like 
explain how to do what we did and be true to the brand was was really weird. But I ended up um, saying over and over again to several different interns, the what we're trying to do with the Shut Up and Stand review is not be funny necessarily, but just be as respectful of our viewers' time as possible. Right. Which for us, it means like, okay, we're going to review the game. But is there a reason why we can't make you laugh at the same time? Like, yeah. and and that's something I ended up saying that is like a rule that we break all the time. But like, I, the <laughs> ideal joke on Shut Up and Sit Down is something that explains how the game feels to play, and makes you laugh, and is critical commentary. But there's, right. but it's not too difficult because board games are inherently ridiculous to do yeah. a joke that does yeah. all that at the right. same time. <laughs> it's true. Um, uh, but I don't know. But, but it's I don't know. It's um, it's it's. It's weird to have found the success that we have and to end up in a position where we just tell goofy jokes and um, and we have, you know, so much donations and so much support. It, it makes me feel really bashful when uh, when talking about uh, the work that we do. So I'm yeah. going to I'm gonna look for it. I'm gonna look for <laughs> they go hide, get yourself out of your bashfulness. Yeah. <laughs> what would you say yes. to, if you could send a message or a letter or just a tip back to 2011 Ooh. Rodney? What would you? Oh, that's a good question. That's one of those classic questions you should always be prepared to answer. Um, yeah, oh, it's, I definitely didn't come up with it. I, yeah, actually, there's, um, a, there's a great. Oh no. Well, you know, huh? 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 huh. I had an interesting. Uh, gosh, twins. My uh, my start to the channel was a little. I was fortunate in a way. I sat down at the beginning, so I did my first uh, first video. And I think, you know, it's not like I knew then that I would still be doing this 10 years from now, but I think about three weeks into doing it, I remember going up to my wife, Christy and saying, wow, I think I'm doing something that I really, really, really like. Wow. You know, I, like wow. I just, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. How long after the first video was that? It's maybe How about three was... weeks or so. Cause like, the very first video series was, was uh, teaching and playing through mansions of madness first edition in my uh, actually seated in the same place I am now, but it was an unfinished basement. And I was, you know, teaching and playing. I knew that I didn't want to review. My my hangup about reviewing, uh, Quinns was I, 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 I always struggled with how do I explain why I like fun. Like I always wrestled with that. I didn't feel like I, I was good at communicating that. I'm so glad there's so many great reviewers out there who can do that. I feel like I always get tongue tied around that. But the one thing I love doing is teaching games. And I discovered that most people don't like learning games. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's what I discovered back in 2011. Like I, it was, I, I've told this story before. There was a BGG thread. Someone, and I was just getting started back into the hobby. And someone asked, "How do you like learning uh, games?" And I'm like, "I'm on BGG. I know what the answer is going to be. People like reading rule books because I like reading rule books." And that thread was full of people saying, "I hate reading rule books. I want my friend to teach me." And that's when I, a little light bulb went on, and I went, "Oh, I love teaching games. I can try to be that friend." that people are looking for that teaches them how to play games. So that's wow. kind of what inspired me to kind of get down that path. But um, so after three weeks of doing it, I felt like, man, this is something that I'm really, I feel really good about doing. And I, it feels like it might suit my skill set or what have you. And uh, yeah, so, so I, at that beginning though, I said, if I think I'm gonna try to do this, I wrote out like a whole list of sort of rules for myself, I guess you could say. Makes sense, I guess. A guy likes rules, but, <laughs> um, but I wrote a few rules to myself. It's, it's almost like it was almost like Future Rodney had sent me a list of things in a way, because I I knew I didn't know quite what I was getting into, and I knew situations would come up that I'd never encountered before, or that I'd never encountered before. So I wanted to be prepared, you know, for how to deal with them and have a sort of a core set of principles <clears> to follow. <throat> so I, you know, I made a few rules for myself. There were simple little things like. Um, one of them was to remember that when I'm making a video, I'm making it for the individuals who are watching it, not for, I, I didn't have this word for it back then, but not for an algorithm. I didn't uh, know it was called the algorithm back then. But like, it, I, I'm, if, I'm, if I teach this properly to one person, I am going to effectively be teaching it properly to several people in a way. You know what I mean? Yeah, Don't get yeah, fixated yeah. on everybody. Get fixated on that person who's watching feels like they're at the table with you. You know, that's what I want. Because when I'm being taught a game, that's how I want to feel. You know what I mean? I want to feel yeah. like I'm being spoken to. Or whenever I've had a good teacher, they made me feel like they were talking just to me. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm, and so it's like mm -hmm. little things like that along the way. Um, I think, but that actually played a lot into, um, I think, surviving YouTube a little bit. Okay. Was, oh, has that been challenging for you? Well, 
you know, you get a lot of feedback, right? Uh, when you, when you I, you know, something. honestly, to me, from my outside perspective, uh, so I, I do want to hear your answer to this, but sure, it's like, please. I feel like we're the loudmouth Brits who are super divisive. And like, we've always, partially right. through geography, felt really cut off from mm. just so much of the, of the press and board game publishers and all the conventions happen in America. Right. You can't get to them. It just feels like we're really separated. But when I, from, so from my, from peering over the fence and looking jealously at sure. you, <laughs> I just see everyone's beloved like you know i don't want to say avuncular but like but not well, least, don't because i don't even know what that word right means, it, so. it means uncle like uh <laughs> sorry as a jerk move from me but like yeah. a, a friendly relative like an older brother sure um yeah and like for your 10th anniversary like for mm. people who haven't seen it there's a 10th anniversary watch it played video which is yeah. just all board game like greatest and brightest people <laughs> just talking about how was, much they love rodney and how much they owe to, that was really lovely that was really nice actually that was really a really heartwarming thing i um i don't know how to answer this question because i i've definitely formed some really mean like the most meaningful relationships i've formed you know outside of family and such have all come through board gaming and through doing specifically media in it you know um I made genuine friendships that will last a lifetime, right? But I also understand what you mean about that sense of separation a little bit. Because I feel that like Shut Up and Sit Down to me almost feels like, again, it's its, its own entity. You know? Like yeah. you and I will bump into each other at a convention and it always feels friendly. Like when I run into you at like uh, the gathering or at Gen Con, I'm like, I get to spend a couple of minutes. This yeah. conversation we're having right now was also like when we could talk in the day in the tech test, I'm like, I'm kind of craving this a little bit. Yeah. Because I yeah. do feel a little bit like you're removed in a way. Like, well, we are like geographically, yeah, basically, you're very, <laughs> yes, yes. yeah. Well, I mean, it's just we, you know, because publishers have to go to cons, but Shut Up and Sit Down has always been able to be like, it's just very tough to budget it, you know. That's the reason we go to, yeah, the cons we go to now tend to be the ones that pay for us to fly out there. I think a big part of my wanting to get into the board game media space, though, was I wanted, like, I craved the connections. It, it was like a desperate, I mean, again, maybe look, it's going back to the start of our conversation. It may be a little bit about that whole thing about not feeling like I knew where I fit in, yeah. you know, exactly. And then finding the thing, like I said, I went to my, I think I found it, you know, it was kind of that feeling of things locking into place. And so I've, uh, to me, a big part of watch it played has been connecting with as many people and other creators as I can. Um, right, and sort of right. being inspired by that and being a part of that sort of, motion i have no idea what the no no but that's about, good but though that that's like that's of... that, it, that does justify what i'm what my sort of the fact that there is a degree of connectivity between like you know this is getting inside baseball now but but like mm. i feel that um north american creators have a, a greater degree of connectivity than than shut up and sit down has right. tucked away in our tiny weird island but i say that it's not like shut up and sit down does as all of the networking it could or arguably should in within the uk because there's so many uk events and publishers and people that we don't go to i think basically well, it's difficult to be a jack of all trades too that's the other thing you know i was talking to a good friend of mine uh, i don't think he'll mind me saying this jamie Kage of the secret gaming podcast mm. And he was saying, like, I, I struggle on social media. He said, like, I don't know how to post or interact sometimes. I don't feel as comfortable in those spaces. And that's a space where I've always felt sort of comfortable. Oh, yeah. And so because I am, it that opens up doors for connecting with a, a bunch of yeah. other creators that way too, right? Because I'm, you know, I, I, I feel a certain comfort in that. That space but we got off we got off topic because we I, you were talking about uh tips <laughs> i mean that's the whole call no uh you were saying that youtube is a place where you received a lot of criticism or, oh yeah uh, well uh, one of the judgment. things i think yeah, certainly there's been i would say by and large more positive than negative okay I, so i, I would want to make that clear i think i've been fortunate that way i think also to your point watch it played as a little more milk and toast it's not meant to be divisive like i'm not coming on there and telling someone that their favorite game but is that's not good <laughs> that's why i'm interested like who are these people like what what well, what has been challenging for you you know it's you you get um so look you're never going to be everyone's cup of tea some mm -hmm. people again like i said i think i i smile too much or i had one co comment that was kind of funny like you're a little too condescending which i thought was funny because i imagine this that's... person being a student in school like okay you yeah. know saying to the teacher <laughs> hey you're a little condescending here yeah <laughs> you know, right like, but but things like that i mean there's been some things i won't repeat but I, you know the thing that i think i've been fortunate maybe uh in my wiring is that i, I hear from some creators that you know they can get a hundred nice comments and if you get that one negative comment it really yeah. like sits in their brain and i think i've been fortunate that i do the opposite if I get a hundred nice comments, and I get one negative. I go, okay, well that gives me context. <laughs> so I'm going to ignore you, <laughs> but I do try to filter out. Like I do try to filter the information from the, the criticism. I remember one 
person, I've told this story before, but I'll share it here. One person said to me in one of my videos, please shut the F up and just teach the game. <laughs> All right. And that's I not I feel like exactly there's not a lot of there's not a lot of messing around in your videos. I feel like you're pretty, you deliver. There was more messing saying. around in the beginning, frankly. There was a little okay. more messing around. And honestly, I took that. I didn't particularly feel that was a productive way of expressing his point of view. And I am implying it was a he. Uh, but the feeling that what I took from that was, yeah, you're here to learn something. That's why you've shown up here. Mm. If I want to wax philosophical about the game, I can do that in another video or somewhere else. So I try to extract from someone's reaction, even if it's a bit visceral, what's what's the value there? The other thing I try to keep in mind, and this is my tip to all creators, you don't know who, who this person is. Whenever I get a negative piece of feedback, um, I have sometimes gone to their channel. I found out they have a YouTube channel, gone to it. Oh, this is a 12 year old. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like sometimes a very like well-written crafted critique. And I realize, oh, this, you know, there's a temptation to project or imagine the criticism is coming from a peer or someone you would respect. Oh, you and know. sometimes it's just a stranger who doesn't really have an investment at all or cares about what you're doing. And I try uh, to do the same thing with the positive stuff. Like I don't, you know, try not to take too much of anything on board, good or bad that way. There's a whole, I've, I feel like I've talked about this site before, but there's a whole horrific flow chart when I meet people at cons, um, when I meet fans, <laughs> because meeting fans is like categorically one of the best parts of the job. Like when we mm -hmm. do signings, um, you know, and meet like lots of people, we, we always say right. it's, the it's the most tiring thing we do um, because it's so energizing and amazing to actually meet these people who are just otherwise just like numbers on a YouTube video sure. um, and, to, and to have them say that they like your stuff or, you know, that the, what it meant for them and they were in a dark place or whatever. But it's exhausting because like, for one thing, you don't know if they're a donor or not, because like they could literally be one of the reasons that we're able to do this for a living, or yeah. they could be someone who's seen two videos. Um, yeah. But either way, probably that will be the only time they ever get to see you, ever. Right. And so you really want to give them a good, a, like a good impression. And that is just like, so it's, it's this super energizing high wire act emotionally, and then on top of that, you have this thing in board that is unique to board games where they'll always say, oh, I bought such and such a game because you told me to. But board games, unlike video games or movies, board games are so reliant on the people at the table. You never know if they're going to be right. like, did they have fun? Because I have no control. Did they spend £100 on a game and then invite all their friends over and it bombed? Because that's Yeah, that's I'm an interesting not... point too. And you don't know where they're at budgetarily. So that $100 to one person yeah. is, is nothing and $100 to somebody else is a big deal. I remember the, the one time I was going to BGG Con how are we doing for time here? I should be careful. Oh, I, I think okay? we, we got at least another, you know, 10, 15 minutes, okay. I think. I'll tell the story quickly. I, I remember the first time I, because I, I've generally not given any opinions on my channel. I've relaxed over the years a little bit more, particularly in some of the live content. But generally speaking, you won't get an opinion in a tutorial video and in most of the stuff that I officially make in on, on the YouTube channel. But I remember going to BGGCon one year and someone had just taught me Red 7 on the plane oh, okay, and yeah. I really enjoyed it. I mean, I really thought it was great fun and it was portable. And so I had it with me everywhere. I was teaching everyone and it did start to kind of ripple through, I think the, the con a little bit of like Rodney's playing this red seven game. He really loves it. And he's, so people were starting to buy it at the con. I remember when in particular, I was sitting at a table with some friends. We were playing a game of something else and I get a little tap on my shoulder and I turn around and this gentleman. He's like, Rodney, I just bought red seven on your recommendation. Can you explain to me why you like this? Because this game is like terrible. <laughs> oh, oh, like it's more, like th this is not fun at all. And that's again going back to my whole thing about like I, I don't know that I I don't know how to quantify to somebody else why I had fun, and and why they're not having fun. You know, and I have no control over. I mean, are they playing it right? Even I don't even know that. You know, I don't know who they're playing it with. I don't know what. You know, they could have just had the worst day of night sleep or something. Like I have no idea what's factoring into the experience they're having you know I, I, but you know that's the part of it i always get a little nervous about because i don't want someone to buy something that they're not going to enjoy uh and i don't i don't want to feel like i've ever suckered somebody into something that they don't enjoy yeah you know? like, yeah <laughs> welcome to why our job is is absolutely yes. terrifying at all yeah times. I, I think it's way worse for a reviewer that way way worse. yeah i mean we get you know you get there's obviously benefits to being a reviewer and that you know sometimes you'll see uh yes by the way none of this is moaning or complaining like no honestly, no i have a charmed life and i'm very happy to be doing what i'm doing <laughs> i mean look we're both doing the job we're supposed these to be are doing little stories that's, that's yeah, great but fun little stories <laughs> uh, but no it's it's nerve-wracking like i we you know talking to tom who's of course been doing 
it's absolutely incredible video reviews on the channel um and yeah. you know you want to make sure you're you're there for you know an employee like you know or a co-worker whatever another reviewer you know emotionally but like he we got to warm up like we got to you know start with like you know ten thousand or like i don't can't remember how many people watched the first episode right but no one cared if we were good there wasn't this huge weight of attention um sure. <laughs> but we built up an audience gradually and we got used to that audience but tom like and you know whoever else ends up doing video reviews for shut up down the future now just like their video reviews are in front of like sort of bomb sixty thousand views yes. and like yeah. you'd better hope that your opinions you know like Right. right that's it's terrifying it's, it's absolutely yeah yeah watch it played expanded a lot in the last year like we we have more contributors now mm. and that was something i was very conscious about is because i've seen it happen before where a channel brings in somebody new and just sort of puts them in front of the audience and mm. it's like sink or swim that's not a good way to it's, introduce it, somebody it's actually you... it's worse than that i think i think yeah. audiences generally uh dislike new things yeah um, and, I, and understandably in a way because you know you when you click subscribe or you follow something, you're doing it because something about that it appealed to you and you kind of knew what you were signing up for in a way. Like if yes. you watch four or five episodes, I see what this is, I like it. And when you suddenly just toss a new face in front of people um, without the proper kind of introduction and why this person's now here, you, I yep. mean, you're really just feeding someone to the wolves, which is uh, not... Uh... <laughs> Not good. My, my wife and I make fun of it. it I, I have sympathy for those audience members, though, because I'm the kind of person where I don't know why I am. I, do you, you have cats, don't you, Rodney? I do now, yeah. <laughs> do you have a thing? I, I, I remember this with cats, but I feel like it's... A, if there's a new piece of furniture in the house, yes. the cat or the dog will sometimes just look at it being like super uncertain. Mm, yeah, what is this new thing? Mm, yeah, not sure about uh, this. Yeah. That's me. Sizing it up. Like, yeah. literally, when we got a new sofa, I, like, or anything new, if my wife changes her hair. You sit on the floor in the corner and just kind of eyed it up a little bit. She'll, she'll go, do you like it? And I'll go, mm. Mm. and I will be that way for at least four days. Okay. Like, it's it's tragic. And, um, but, but so I under, I get it when our audience members are like, who's this new person? Don't like them. And then what's funny yeah. is that it operates on a delay. Because Tom started doing like all of these absolute, I mean, he won't mind me saying this, um, a whole bunch of absolutely overwhelmingly good video reviews. And then he yeah. did one which he and I like looked at it and was like, this is good, but it's not as good as the rest. Sure. And yeah. not, well, no, it's, it's like whatever. It's the point is, it was amazing, amazing, almost amazing. Yeah. But that almost amazing, the commenters were like, this video is amazing, like this is the best. Because they were react, they, they were now used to him, but yeah. they were looking yeah. at the video and going, well, I like this. This is the first good one. It's like, no, it's not. It, you just <laughs> got used to the guy. Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah. Very silly. Very and silly. Have it, uh, yeah, we're all like that, I suppose, on some level, really. <laughs> how have you found uh, bringing in new uh, new hires to watch it played? It's been fantastic. It has been so good. I mean, at different times, like I started the channel with my, my children, uh, Luke and Andrew, like we did it, the th three of us together for a number of years, and then they grew up and, you know, had, had, had lives. Um, they couldn't just dedicate to the basement here with me, but, um, and then I've had, uh, other co-hosts, Pep came on for a while and then he left the channel and now I'm working with, uh, my best friend and, and other friends. And it's, it's been just phenomenal because I always enjoyed doing a variety of things on the channel besides just doing tutorial videos. I always did other videos, but the tutorials became kind of the thing that maybe it was best suited for me in, in some respects, but I still want to do other things on the channel. I wanted to bring a little more entertainment, a little more fun, conversational type yeah, things to the yeah. channel. And now we can do that. And it's creatively invigorating working with people who just have different, better talents, frankly, than I do in, in areas. Yep, yep. And it just makes all of us better. And when you, and I, I imagine this is true for shut up and sit down. I feel like I've seen that through, you know, uh, Ava and uh, Tom coming on. I genuinely care about the people I'm working with. And we, yeah. and I feel that goes in, in all directions. We all really care about each other. And there's something very, again, magical, special. I feel very fortunate, you know, uh, yeah. because it is a, there is a little bit of a trust fall thing that happens when you like, you, uh, first of all, putting yourself out there into the public and then you're asking other people to put themselves out in front of your public, um, yeah. you know, the same way. So it's, you know, it's, um, there's a quote that I, I can't remember where it's from, but I, I rely on it a lot, which is um, good work is done by talented people having fun together. Mm, yeah, and uh, yeah. I, I all often return to that and use it as a kind of lodestar. Um, but you're, but the, but it's, it's, the, it's really a game of two halves because it's on the one hand, you just want to make each other laugh and entertain one another. 
On the other hand, we got like 80,000 people who are going to watch any video review we do and judge it mercilessly. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's, yeah, like, I don't know. It's, it's, it's perhaps more so than, I don't know. Yes, invigorating and everything, but I think there's a kind of hard edged sort of emotionality that with hiring you, which shut up and sit down, new hires have to go through that I, I really, really sympathize, you know, because a review is like it's it's an opinion and opinions yeah. aren't always like what am i trying to say here it's just we're supposed on the one hand shut up to down is just supposed to be this stupid goofy fun on the other hand if you make a mistake if you have a bad take the audience will let you know it and that can be crippling for your confidence sure. for yeah. your happiness that week like it, it, I mentioned it, it, I described it as a high wire act before. That's what it feels like. And it's a fun high wire act. You know, we're smiling yeah, because we yeah. are having fun. But if we fall, <laughs> yeah. it's not good. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. And well, so that is the thing, right? It, it, it's There's a level of responsibility that comes with this thing, you know. Mm. Uh, again, not to speak too highly of it. I don't want to get too navel gazy about it. But, it, you know, that was one of the things. Actually, speaking of, of social media, that was one of the things that I think I realized maybe in the last four or five years, particularly is but i tend to take a pretty positive approach on social media generally speaking i tend to try to keep it light and positive while still where i can draw attention to issues i think are worth talking about but one of the things that it dawned on me is you know if i'm having a bad day quinn's like before watch it played the people who had to deal with me were the people who agreed to sign up to deal with me my <laughs> wife my kids my employer you know what i mean yeah if I decide to go on to social media with my bad day, I am tinkering with the chemistry of thousands of people. Meaning, I don't know the person who's reading it, what kind of day they're having. Maybe they're having the worst day of their life and then they're reading their Twitter feed and suddenly I'm chiming in with like the miserable day I'm having. And it just added another layer of pain on their day in some way, mm -hmm. you know? And it's made me realize like, oh, you have to be careful about how you utilize the platforms that you have because you oh, just yeah. don't know how you're tinkering with people's chemistry that way. Yeah, um, I, uh, I, <sighs> it's, it just, and that's not that's not to say that everything has to be rainbows and sunshine all the time. Like that's that's not what I'm saying. Just to be clear, but I, I do feel a certain weight of like gotta be careful. You know what tools I use to express certain things. Yeah, there's um uh, a thing I've, I I can't be on social. I've 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 I deleted my Facebook long ago, and mm. I barely post on Twitter anymore because I, it's just not good for me. Um, right, I straight up find it bad for my attention and bad for my mood, and um, it just it just makes me less happy. Except for TikTok, which I don't post on. I just t <laughs> like that the TikTok. I mean, people say the algorithm for TikTok is so good. It's not true. It's just that there's reasons why it's so good, but it will just start showing you stuff that's really entertaining very, very, right. very quickly. Yes. Um, I'm here for TikTok. I'm one of those elderly people on TikTok. It's really unfortunate. <laughs> good for you. Uh, but when you talk about, uh, oh goodness, like, I don't know, tinkering with the emotional chemistry of people, that does, mm. I, uh, my favorite thing about my, and it's like, it was still, it, it was something I loved 10 years ago and it's still my favorite thing to do now. One of my favorite things about comedy is, uh, and just being goofy, which shut them down the course is, is when you get serious, it goes through your audience like a scalpel. Like, and that to me, like, you know, it, which has enabled us to talk about things that our reviewers care about. Like, you know, think, right. I'm thinking about, you know, like uh, in, the, uh, in the Undaunted Review, deciding to talk about, you know, like perceptions of World War II that are very, you know, like um, Ameri like essentially white person centric or yep. um, other bits and pieces. But it's like, I, I love telling stupid jokes. <laughs> but I partially love telling stupid jokes because the tonal shift when you get serious is so powerful. Yeah, that, yeah. And I just, I love playing with that so, that moment. so yeah. much. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but that's what I do instead of getting my jollies in social media because I, I, it just, I can't be trusted with it. I really can't. Well, I feel like I should uh, turn a question back on you that you asked me earlier. You asked me like, what tip would I give myself? now do you have one that you would give to yourself now oh you son of a gun then? uh i always I write uh, um what tip but i oh yeah no uh just, just talk more slowly oh really uh, yeah just i it's uh, true because my... people can always turn two times speed on <laughs> yeah yeah right? no i just i the reason i can't watch a lot of early shut up and sit down and I, I i not that i can't i could and there's a lot of stuff i really like about it um but my presenting is just, it's just motor mouth mile a minute. I thought that if I talked really quickly, that was the same as right. doing it well. 
Yeah, and yeah. it's just it's just completely intolerable for me now. Also, yeah, it took like three years of doing Shut Up and Sit Down until my wife was like, "Have you thought about smiling? Have you thought about <laughs> looking like you're having a good time?" <laughs> so, yeah, and I just I, that's what really gets on my nerves about Shut Up and Sit Down. Yeah. It's just frowning and talking really, really, really fast, and it's yes. just. <laughs> <laughs> just Rodney, it makes me want to die going back and looking at that stuff. I, because it, I maybe, think maybe that's part, a good reason not to go back then. <laughs> yeah, it just, I just at the time I was I just, charmed though when I was watching that first episode. I was, I realized as I was watching that I was smiling ear to ear. You know what I mean? Like I, I wasn't laughing out loud. And that's not a critique on the jokes. What I'm saying is it was filling me with joy. There was something about seeing that. It is a time capsule, right? It's about seeing people embarking on something very new not realizing 10 years later what they're going to that they're still going to be doing it like, i mean that's an interesting thing right twins because not only when you started r running the tape there uh did you know oh 10 years later i'm going to be still doing it still doing it and running an in-person convention and uh, a virtual convention and putting out expansions for board games on kickstarter <laughs> and, you know, and doing a podcast you know it's how, how can one you can't anticipate those things you know, really? No, uh, it's it's the only thing we can do that keeps us grounded. I think is continuing to just love games really earnestly, um, mm -hmm. and then th just you just pray the rest falls into place, and it tends to. Like I think the 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 reason that we you know that first shot you're talking about in the first episode where we're surrounded by Canadian geese, uh, yeah. lo love them. Um, the reason you check out and you get your microphone in the rain and you borrow a video camera is just because we wanted to tell people about board games because yeah. we cared about board games that much and that's still the core of the site and honestly it's really intimidating now to, to have conventions to have a podcast and to have this business that people rely on for all kinds of different reasons because it still feels fragile that's a weird thing about being a critic it yep. still feels two horrible reviews away from everyone going oh shut up it's a dance used to be that's, that's funny i was saying the same thing to my uh partner the other day uh you know really saying like oh yeah i the same thing it's all very fragile it's all very I, I said like you know i'm doing tutorials today maybe next year i won't be like who knows like it's you just don't know and what it, makes you think really, for the the you might not be doing them in a year because i don't know how long people will have tolerance for a canadian guy making tutorial videos you know like, <laughs> i just don't know it's not you know what i mean like you just don't yeah. know and, but I, and also like all this requires a certain amount of fi financial momentum mm. and you don't know if that will be there a year from now and and yeah. that's that's hard to but I, you know i would say too very very fortunate I, I imagine i could speak for you in this respect maybe i shouldn't say that uh, i'll let you chime in if you want to say that I'm speaking for you or not, but like, again, very fortunate to have had the privilege to be able to do that in the first place. Like there was yes. fewer barriers to my entry getting started. And not just because of the time when I did it, but also just in my life, my life, I had the freedom. I had a wife who was willing to support me while I did that. There's yep. lots of great talented people who don't have the same luxuries that I did yep. when I started. And, um, and I'm, I'm so happy to see that the board game media world is expanding. It's growing beyond maybe what it, it was like even five years ago in terms of representation diversity the types of voices the way games are being talked about the types of games and themes we're seeing yeah. aren't just the same thing over and listen everyone's like gets concerned about like the critiques on some of the same themes being done it's not like they're going anywhere you're still gonna be able <laughs> to play all your traditionally tropey games but now we're seeing even more yes and there's a, a long way to go on all that but it, it is i think we're seeing some positive movement there. Oh, really absolutely, engaging. absolutely. Yeah. Um, but I think you uh, you hit on something there that I, I think it would it would behoove us. I'd say, well, I use these words. I don't even know what they all mean. I don't really know what behoove. <laughs> That's something means. about a horse, I think. But okay. yeah, okay. We should we should uh, hoof it up uh, by talking about <laughs> yeehaw. Okay, we're all the content creators or well, people who want to get into board game content creation. Mm. I mean, this mm. is a topic that has been done, you know, like forever. But sure. hey, let's do it again. What are our what advice would we give people to try to get into board game media creation today? And I've got one tip that I always say, and I say this okay. to designers as well. When designers are wondering, like if people want to get into design, they don't know how to theme their games. The thing yeah. I always say is, what do you really care about that isn't board games? Like, it, like I always we shut up and sit down. I feel like likes Flam Rouge about eighteen times more than the rest of the board game industry. <laughs> yes, yeah, but, yeah. But Flam Rouge is a is a game about cycling. But your first indication that the person who made it really cares about cycling is it's set in like the nineteen twenties. Like it's mm. this really weird, right. like after World War One, pre World War Two era with very like idiosyncratic bicycles and costumes. 
and yeah. um and then sure enough when i met uh Asger, the designer um and realized how much he cared about cycling um i was like yeah that comes through in the game but my the but the 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 version of that for board game content creators is like what what kind of game do you really care about but also what kind of board game content do you wish existed that doesn't like don't try and copy someone else try and earnestly think about what games and what kind of coverage you want to exist that doesn't exist and go that that sounds really obvious when i'm saying it out loud but like look into it's, it's, your own heart it's the same touchstone like i was enamored with mansions of madness as a game like the mm. uh, adventuring having a character telling a story i knew what i liked and i liked it deeply and i think that is it and when i think about some of the new content creators and i think like lord of the board like when he started it was a lot of uh, asynchronous games with and he would do videos on if you're playing this faction in root here are strategies yeah you know he liked these kind of asynchronous games asynchronous is that the right word for it uh, asymmetric Asymmetric. That's what I was trying to say. I knew I had it wrong. Asymmetric. Yeah, exactly. And so that that was his passion point, right? And so that comes through. Our family plays games. You know, they're very concerned about diversity in the hobby yep. and seeing that push forward. So that becomes part of their passion and, and motivation. And I think you do. Yeah, it's a very good tip. You do have to be somewhat passionate about it because you're not going to uh, have much more to go on except for that, <laughs> especially initially. Like at the end of the day, it's not like Sometimes people will say, oh, you do videos on YouTube. That must be a lot of fun. And listen, I have a lot of fun. I'm not going to put that down. But when I'm staring down the barrel of 13 hours of shooting video, that's not fun. But at the end of that day, I'm very satisfied. And that satisfaction is because I'm doing something I'm passionate about at the end of the day. Yes. I, think, uh, right? Ro so. I, I gave a, my friend is starting a, his own business and um, I was briefly able to sound real smart when I, did, <laughs> when I described to him that yes. people think about, you know, like how much time do I have and how much money do I have as those are resources when you start right. your own business uh, or your own hobby, you know, board game content creation. But the third pillar of that is how much passion do you have? Because that right. is a resource that depending on the kind of work you do, it will go up and it will go down. <clears throat> but if it runs out, that's, as bad, if not worse. In fact, it's worse because if you run out of time or money, those are solvable problems. If you run out of passion, you're it's very goose. difficult. Like, yeah. yeah, it's yeah. it's it, you're really going to struggle to get that back. My, my gave, big, t yeah, go ahead. Sorry, no, go ahead. no, 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 no. I was going to say my big tip. If I was going to give one tip, is it's 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 sort of similar, but mine would be know why you're doing it. Yeah, mm. because if it is, let's because some people it might be for numbers. I want a certain number of viewers, or it might be free games. That's okay. Just know that that's why you're doing it, because then you can evaluate if you're not getting that thing you'll know, oh, this is maybe not for me. I think sometimes people get into it, they don't know exactly why they're doing it. And then when they're not getting what they want, they don't even know what it is. Here's here's something that happened to me. I went to YouTube, when I hit a certain number of subscribers, YouTube invited me up to one of their workshop things. And I went there <clears> and I'm with all, people who like have millions of subscribers and stuff, right? And I was talking to one person in particular, and this story really stuck out to me. She did makeup videos and her say a typical trend on a video would be like something like this okay like this kind of viewership on it and she and i know for anyone listening to podcasts my angle i'm pointing up at like a 45 <laughs> degree angle into the air growth i'm showing growth and she said we wanted to do something different i had this idea for a new type of video and so we did it but it only got this amount of growth i'm now my hand i have a second hand at 40 degree angle okay <laughs> so not as much still growth still was received well by the audience but not as well and she said so we knew we couldn't do that type of video again hmm. i went what do you mean so, because it didn't achieve the same views as the other one and i went what do you but didn't you enjoy doing it didn't you like you were doing something new that you wanted to do and people were liking it You're like yeah but if it's not getting the the views, then we're just wasting our time. And that's when I went, like I left that place going, oh, wow, some creators are like 10% human and 90% YouTuber. Oh. And, you know what I mean? Like they're, they're, they're doing it for a different thing. They're chasing a, th like yeah. something different, you know? Yeah. And, I, and think, I, there's something to be learned from that. Like I left the meeting going, you know what? Maybe I do need to be a little more YouTuber. Like I need to find, cause I do want my videos to do well. And there are strategies we can employ to help with that. But I don't want to lose that, hey, I'm just proud of this thing that we made. <laughs> like, and, and some people liked it and I'm happy. That's good. You know? Yeah, no, I think, uh, yeah, you and I have done the, the the two bookends of what is required to be a content creator. The first of which is, you know, like figuring out what you're passionate about. And then the other is figuring out where you want to get to with it. And then yeah. I guess if you have your start point, you know, if you have a solid start point, which is this is what I care about or, and that other people aren't doing, because I guess within my concept of like, you should figure out what you're passionate about. Presumably, if you're passionate about something, like if you're really passionate about, no pun included, 
like yeah. no pun included is there um right. so, but if you're but yeah so figure out what you're passionate about what you figure out that no one else is doing that's your start and then figure out what you like whether it's you know do you want it for the prestige because i could see like people doing you know making board game content just to go to the conventions just to meet the people because right. there's a lot of really great people and that's yes. enough yeah yeah exactly you know i think Sh shut up and sit down certainly wasn't like it wasn't making money for years and it wasn't making like sustainable money for way more years after that <laughs> sure, um yes. but we would just have to begin with we were just happy getting free games and to yeah. and to meet people and I think that's a, a nice, you know, uh, you said earlier when you meet people who are viewers at the shows, that can be very rewarding. And you don't know if you're talking to someone who's, if they've watched a couple of times or, or maybe they even support financially. I I just want to say like quickly, because, you know, we've sort of been talking to each other, but I know people are watching this right now. The support that I, I feel, I feel I will speak for both of us here. Again, correct me if I'm wrong. The support we've received from people who watch and who care about what we're doing is so deeply meaningful. It's very yes. difficult to express and i was i was trying to figure a way to say this the other day because it's it's not transactional it's not a purely a transactional thing i make a thing for you and then you support a kickstarter or a fundraiser or a patreon like yeah. there's that element that's in there but to me um and that element's necessary like the thing doesn't exist without money that's a reality okay mm -hmm. that's just a fact of life but what moves me <laughs> what gets me up in the morning is that that again that nice comment or that interaction at a convention where someone um, connected in some way. And not only that, that sense that I have a connection to them, you know, that we share this passion for a thing that is still kind of obscure and honestly like daunting, you know, and we've, yeah. we've, we've stuck in it and we enjoy it, whether you're into party games or war games or whatever the thing is you're into, we have this shared language. And that, again, that finding that tribe has been really a important thing for me, I think. Yeah, I, you know, I think that's a really beautiful way to describe it, Rodney. And, um, you know, uh, people who I don't run marathons, but people who do, yeah, uh, we have the Brighton Marathon right outside my window. Um, okay, every, every however long it is. Um, but the people in my family who run marathons say the thing you don't expect when you show up to a marathon, you know, you do your training, maybe you think you can do it, is right. when you get there on the day, every the, the sheer number of people on either side of the racetrack cheering for you yeah and that's yeah, what it yeah. is you got to run the marathon for no <laughs> one other than yourself but your commenters who are sending you nice emails or you know like praising you or thanking you or whatever yeah or just leaving nice comments nice comments are so important like i, I i've been doing shut up for 10 years i've just realized we've never asked our audience to leave nice comments because they always do but maybe we <laughs> yes. should because yeah. those nice comments are the people on the side of the marathon who just make it easier i'm running the race for me but all the praise and support is- That's a beautiful analogy. I will be borrowing that. I will be yeah, borrowing well, that. That's a great analogy. That was analogy. teamwork. That was teamwork. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, uh, I would. Let me see. Oh, uh, hang on. Wait, before. So the next panel is at quarter two. So we have, yes. you know, like maybe five more minutes. Uh, sure. I got a, I got a, a, a couple. Well, no, okay. there's, there's there one or two. I've got this written down. If you were a board game manual, which board game manual would you be? <laughs> Take a, take a second, because there's lots. And I do want a specific games manual. Mm, I know, it's going to be very difficult. I, I don't want to say Final Girl again, but that was like the most recent one that's, I you read. Can't, that's the one you I, just read. I know, read. I keep that's... hammering on about. I know, I know. But also, hang on, you, that's that's not... Why are you specifically the manual for uh, Van Ryder Games' <laughs> Final Girl? Like, that? You because it's good? Cause... Yeah, because I want to be good now. Right. Um, let me think. I, I'm going to give you another one. Take your time. I'm looking at the shelves. I'll tell you the kind I don't want to be. Okay. This happens. I, I've seen this trend in, in rule books lately that I'm not a big fan of. Uh, they will try to make the, the rule book as small as possible because mm -hmm. they recognize from a marketing perspective, it's more attractive to say this has a three page rule book than to say it has a 13 page rule book. Mm. And the problem that I encounter over and over and over again in that situation is that then the rules aren't comprehensive enough to be com like, com I can't, yeah. com I can't comprehend what you're trying to teach me. You've left out too many things. My feeling is if you want to have a three page rule book, design a three page rule book game. But if yeah. you're trying to design a game that has a uh, hundred different actions, you can't make a three page rule book. You've got to, the rule book's got to grow with it. If it's going to be of any use to anybody. Uh, can so I, I guess what I, but getting at there is I want to be a rule book that is <laughs> what it is trying to accomplish. <laughs> if I'm a, if I'm a 10 person, Rule book. I want to be a ten-page rule book. You know, like I don't yeah. want to be. 
I want to be, I guess, authentic. Is that? I think that's to me. That just sounds like a, 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 a like an allegory or an analogy or whatever it is for aging gracefully. It's like you know, <laughs> maybe so. You're a you're a whatever like thirty five page rule book now, and you want to look like a thirty five. <laughs> yes, you yes. look like a thirty five. I I have a I have a manual hot take for us to get as we're closing Please. out this panel. I think I as a manual intermediate. I think I know the correct format for a manual now and i'm very curious okay. to put this past yeah me. please yeah I, I see this in uve rosenberg games a lot the correct manual is a manual where every page has a dividing line down the middle yeah. and mm -hmm. you oh look at did you hear that yeah, everybody that listen to it roddy just mm. yeah, yeah. <laughs> dividing line down the middle on the left is the rules yeah. and on the right is like just like mostly examples of exact so if the left is just like the legalese and the right is the exact or sometimes it's like examples and very rosenberg's tips or a little reminders reminder. a, little, a little reminders. summary I, I, Aaliyah does that like and that's a really lovely thing they have the rules down the left side and then the right merge and it's here's a quick sentence summary of it which is so lovely when you're going back after three months of being a shelf and you, you remember the rules you just need a little hand holding you don't want to have to read the whole thing again that's mm. that's a lovely thing. Do that's, you that's have a, that's a helpful rule book? I want to be a helpful rule book. <laughs> okay, are. I'll be cast you as a Burgundy's are. rule book. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, you are the helpful rule book of human beings in the board game industry. Um uh one final question, just to make sure, sure. we already round this off in a happy on a happy zone. Okay. Oh, 10 years of doing watch it play, providing this immense service to the board game space. You've made so many people's lives so much easier and happier. But what is your single happiest memory in 10 years of being in the board game industry when was the like i because i have a few of those shut ups down but like times where i think i just look back and smile and feel like that was a that was a good like minute or you know hour or whatever like a specific game and interaction what do you think it was i oh gosh this this could sound like uh <laughs> i don't know I don't it better care. not be the final girl. No, I know. <laughs> <laughs> that time I opened up Final Girl, it was amazing. <laughs> oh, Van Ryder, you're gonna be paying me so much after this. Um, <laughs> no, I was gonna say like I don't, I don't know how this is gonna sound. I don't care how it sounds because it's true. I think some of my best moments have been being at conventions. There's two different types of interactions that are really, really meaningful. Meeting people who I've admired from afar for a long time, or maybe had a long-term uh, like interaction with online and meeting them in person for the first time, and then discovering that everything about them is just all the reasons why I was yes. in the first yes. place. You know I mean? yes. like, and and yeah. then realizing, oh, I'm I'm now going to have a relationship with this person for who knows how long, maybe the rest of my life. Like that is not like a board gaming YouTube thing, but that's that's what that's the best stuff that I've extracted from doing this yeah. is meeting people who have a similar passion, shared love for this thing. And then I want to be in their lives in some capacity. You know, mm. I mean, I, 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 I worked jobs. I didn't have that feeling with the people I worked with. I was happy to work with them, but I didn't like when the weekend came, it was like, see you on Monday. You know, the people I work with now, I want to see them all the time. I want to see them yeah. every day. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah, yeah. So I don't know how to pin that to like one game or one experience. But it's also, it's also, and I'll just quickly say, like viewers that I've met in person that, you know, they've shared something. You got to be careful. If, you, if, you, if you're too kind about the show, I will hug you. Like I just, because I don't know how else to express it. I want to say like, you've, you've impacted my life, you know, in, in ways that you can't even understand, that I can't even understand, you know, that impacts my family's life. Like it's, so it's Do you know, yeah. Yeah. uh the what's the board game geek uh playthrough series game night game night right? yeah game night yeah when i was at uh, i was at a convention and i was stood next to this this guy and i was talking to him and i and then, and then suddenly i had this like miniature freak out he was like wait how do i know this guy <laughs> right. uh, when, when when did we introduce each other and i realized that it, it it wasn't um it wasn't that we'd ever introduced each other he didn't i don't even know if he knew who it was i just assumed he was my friend because he was yes. one of the people from game night who right. I've watched and I was just, but, but yeah. he was so exactly who he was on game night <laughs> that I was like, well, he's my friend. <laughs> he doesn't yes. know who I am. Like, but that is maybe if you're thinking about getting into the board game hobby, take it from two people who have been in it for 10 years that like, there's just, I think it could be as simple as because you only get into board games if you like being around people and you like silly fun. 
everyone like it's so many people just seem to be like just amiable friendly yeah. social thoughtful like and it, that's what makes going to convention and look so there's amazing. all kinds of challenges there's all kinds of things that can get in the way it's not perfect that's for sure um and we all have different experiences in that hobby um good and bad but there's a lot of good there's still a mm, lot of good you know it really um, is. and I'm, I'm very thankful for the good yeah uh, yeah, that's, that we both yeah. got to enjoy through it. Yeah, certainly. Like uh, maybe it's rich just from two people who've won the like you know diversity privilege Olympics of you know straight yes. white yeah. met to be like it's all good and everyone's friendly and you know look I even put my hair white that's how I'm going full I'm going all <laughs> yeah 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 but uh, but certainly still uh, it's uh, it seems like a well, at least for us a very happy space to be and and getting better every day or every month yeah. at least every year who knows. Well, I think we all have a responsibility to help make it that way. I mean, that's yeah. the thing. I think that's something maybe I felt a little more over the last few years that I didn't realize um, and a little late to the game on, frankly, recognizing that I exist, exist in a space where I'm not going to encounter much friction, Yep. either for my gender, my skin color, uh, my or yeah, orientation, everything like that. And that's not the case for everybody. So what can I do to help uh, lower some of those barriers in my own way, you know, whatever that can be? So. I don't know. Even if you come to it late, I suppose you can try to find ways to <laughs> to assist. Yeah, uh, and uh, with that sort of like uh, stumbled conclusion to realizing our own privilege, uh, <laughs> yes. we should wrap this up. But Rodney, this has been absolutely amazing. I've I've had an absolute blast. That was like an hour and forty minutes, and it just did not feel like Jeez. that at all. No, it didn't like, at all. Uh, yeah. But we knew this I, would happen. Too much. Well, it, 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 just... it was it was a real speaking privilege, privilege to spend the time with you. I was really looking forward to this, just because I knew it would be a gift to be able to spend an hour and a half just talking about something that I know we're both pretty passionate about. So you reckon? I feel like I've walked away with a couple of great analogies that I'll be borrowing and using, and I hope the people watching enjoyed or listening enjoyed. And I know there was some bets Sorry. in the chat about when I would if I would finish my drink, and I did. I did finish oh. my drink. So <laughs> well done. I nursed uh, it. <laughs> thank you all, everyone watching this on Twitch uh, for watching. You've all been uh, great. Presumably, I don't know. I've been talking to Rodney. I haven't been paying attention. I'm going to jump into chat now, see what they're saying. Rodney, yeah. this has been absolutely great. Uh, and uh, yeah, I guess see you when I see you. Maybe I'll see you in another 10 years. Imagine that. That's I hope chilling, I'll see isn't you sooner it? than that. We'll see. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Take care, Rodney. Uh, Cheers. See you Bye, soon. everybody. Bye-bye. Thanks, man.